honor to be invited. Um, I, having heard who's sort of filled this job last year, I'm a little intimidated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to keep you entertained. Uh, and uh, thank you again for the invitation. All right. So, um, and just to get this out of the way, my research has been funded by NSF, NIH, and Gates Foundation to various degrees. All right. So. Uh, this is a little small, I apologize, but this is a bill of deaths from Boston in 1839. And um, back then, our sort of best definitions of disease and uh, causes of death were a lot more interesting than they are today. Uh, we did understand a lot of things. Uh, so we've got, there's a couple of things here that are really strange. So we've got one guy who was poisoned by paint. Um, <laughs> We had nine people who died from worms, unfortunately. Um, there's some things that we don't really understand. I'm not quite sure how gravel killed this person. <laughs> uh, but there's also things that you would recognize here very straightforwardly. Um, 212 people died from scarlet fever as well. Um, 222 people died from consumption, which is tuberculosis, which was well identified at the time. Um, measles is on here somewhere, although it only killed three people at a time. Uh, smallpox killed 58 people. There's a lot of things that, um, for historical reasons, you would recognize. Uh, about 100 years later, here's a, a table of diseases in uh, uh, Cataraugus County. I apologize, not for, but uh, diseases that people had had. And here, this is a much more standard list. At this, by this point, we sort of had, had diseases down. So we had 62% of people having been exposed and had measles. 26% uh, having had rubella, German measles. We got whooping cough, we got scarlet fever again, typhoid fever, meningitis, polio. So list of things you would think of scary infectious diseases being. Uh, things like smallpox, which had been a big epidemic disease, at this point were already relatively well controlled just by public health measures. Uh, and things have gotten better since then. And so since 1900, uh, disease uh, mortality rates per 100,000 per year uh, have gone down significantly. Uh, and most of that is due to infectious disease decline over time. So over here in 1918, there was a huge spike because of 1918 flu pandemic, uh, but it, things have gone down. Uh, we've gotten rid of yellow fever, smallpox in the 18th century. Cholera was briefly an issue in the U.S., but went away. We controlled that. <laughs> Scarlet fever, measles, pertussis, plague, all gone. Smallpox has been eradicated. Polio has almost been eradicated. And this is all because of hygiene practices that have been improved, vaccines, and antibiotics. Really, And, the, and life expectancy has marvelously increased from around under 40 years of age in 1840, up to over 70 years of age. So really wonderful successes over the last 100 years. With now, but our challenges aren't done in a lot of ways. Um, so polio eradication. We eradicate smallpox. We eradicate rinderpest. Just recently, let's get rid of polio. Well, we've been working on that for decades now, and it's not done. We still got polio in. Nigeria, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, a little in northern India, and now we've got a resurgence in Syria. Uh, measles eradication. Uh, we have a perfectly good vaccine for measles. We can't get rid of it. Uh, it's a huge infection. There's no evolution, um, but it's so transmissible that we just haven't been able to overcome its transmissibility. Malaria, huge problem still. No vaccines, evolving resistance to all of our treatments could become a bigger problem. Uh, tuberculosis, no vaccines. Again, we're about having diseases that are evolving resistance to our antibiotics. And then occasionally we have issues with pandemics. Uh, okay, we had a flu pandemic, which was kind of a fizzle in 2009. We had SARS outbreak, which was fortunately controlled. We've got the current Ebola outbreak, which seems to be coming under control. But these are things we're always worrying about. Um, and more generally, we have drug resistance. And so this is the picture we'd be like to say uh, about our modern medicine. We've got the, the good nurse here who's uh, got the shot, and the, the little kid is rolling up his sleeve and going to be <laughs> tough and get the shot. Um, everything's going to be saved. Anyone want to guess what country that's from? 
It is North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how most Western countries are dealing with this at the moment, unfortunately. All right, so, a little, so as our management of infectious diseases has improved, our understanding has improved as well at a mathematical level, as well as a medical level. So this is sort of the first modeling work that was ever done on infectious diseases. And, uh, from Bernoulli, one of the Bernoulli family being some of our uh, poster people. Uh, Daniel Bernoulli did a model of smallpox transmission, and he was primarily interested in a financial uh, problem. How do you price annuities for people when you know that smallpox is around? And if someone is uh, susceptible to smallpox, or if they had smallpox and are now immune, that really changes their risk of death at this time. Uh, and so he made a model of that. And so it's a simple linear model. He went and did all the analysis. Um, and, uh, and, and there's no disease transmission in here, in part because the germ theory of disease transmission didn't exist at the time that Bernoulli did this. That came quite a while afterwards. Um, so in 1866, there are, at that point, our theory of diseases was really starting to uh, get a foothold in science. So around this time, John Snow did his famous work with cholera, removing the pump handle in, in South London and stopping the outbreak of cholera by sort of stopping access to contaminated water. Around the same time, William Farr was, Farr was from John Snow's nemesis. He was sort of a data-driven statistics guy and so Joe Snow was just going on a hunch and he didn't have the data to support it and there were all these flaws with this hypothesis. Unfortunately for Farr, Snow was right. But um, Farr made his own contribution. So he had he'd been studying epidemics from a statistical standpoint for years. And in 1866, there was an outbreak of cattle plague. It was killing cattle all across uh, England. And uh, people were saying this was going to kill all the cattle, it was going to be the end of meat, it was going to cause a huge food crisis. And Farr said, no, it's, that's not. It's, okay, it's going up right now, but there's a normal law for how epidemics progress. They go up, they level off, and they come down. And that's how all em epidemics progress. And he argued this in a, in a newspaper article, <coughs> saying that people were sort of making a, a crying wolf when they didn't need to. And a, a few weeks later, it came down just like he predicted. So this became as known as the normal law. And the, the nor this is a bit of a, 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 a misnaming in some way. Uh, it's called the normal law in some sense because it's sort of a, a standard thing. But it's also called the normal law because Farr saw this and said bell curve. There's some bell curve under here. We should be seeing a normal distribution. There must be a normal curve under here that's governing these processes. So for the next few decades, those people who were interested in this spent a lot of effort trying to figure out how to use, the, how to derive a normal curve for the process uh, of epidemic progression. And Pearson was one of the ones who did that, um, but ultimately it was sort of the wrong direction. And it, right in 1927, Kermack and McKendrick put together the first really good model that was mechanistic based and sort of is our standard approach to this problem now. And they said, well, you know, that thing that looked like a normal curve, it's not really a normal curve, it's more like a secant, hyperbolic secant. So they, they showed that this data for plague in Bombay approximately fit a uh, hyperbolic secant, which they derived as an approximation to this simple three equation, dif ordinary differential equation. Uh, and ever since then, this sort of model has been our, our standard. And the idea is that uh, there's an interaction between susceptible and infected individuals. And so this compartmental diagram, um, this is the number of susceptibles, this is the number of infected number of recovered individuals, and the arrows represent flows with the combination of uh, susceptibles and infecteds interacting to create new infected individuals. And this nonlinear effect they represent with a mass action term, it's just a simple multiplication, and that gave them all the nonlinear dynamics they needed in their work. So a, a few years later, so in that model there's implicitly the idea of a threshold for disease transmission, and that was formalized. So Ross, Blocka, McDonald, May, Diekman, and uh, Pauline Vandendriesch have all made progress on this just within the last decade, sort of formalizing this threshold in epidemic models. And it's sort of really a percolation threshold from the physics literature, but we call it R-naught, and it, 
It uh, got, uh, I was very happy. This is from the movie Contagion. Uh, Kate Winslet <laughs> got up there and did some math on the blackboard. It's always good to see uh, a movie star doing stuff that you're familiar with in math. <laughs> um, but so, so this was a big deal. And the reason this was a big deal was because I said, you don't have to stop all the transmission of a disease to get rid of it. You just have to reduce a below a critical threshold. And if you want to stop malaria transmission, you don't have to kill all the mosquitoes. You just have to kill enough of them. And a lot of times, that enough is achievable, while all is not achievable. And so this radically changes our perspective on disease management. It makes it a much more approachable problem. And a lot of advances in terms of disease transmission management uh, have come out of this realization. So now we're in a, a, a computational age of disease modeling. There's been a lot of stuff that I could have thrown in there um, as background. But uh, just sort of skip ahead to now. We, I call the EpiSense age, uh, where we've got large computational models, and we can do big spatially explicit simulations of disease transmission. And so this is a, oh, I'm sorry, the, the reference didn't come out here. This is some of Neil Ferguson's work on, means, on flu, bird flu spread in Thailand, and they, they've got these sort of very complicated, nice pictures that come out. And there's a lot of details under there that one can worry about and argue, but we've got very sophisticated stuff that we can work with. So all my references are screwed up, I apologize. Um, so, uh, but this, I think we still have problems. One of the things we have issues with are vaccine scares. So back in 2004, uh, one of the vaccine makers for influenza, Chiron, uh, screwed up a batch of vaccine. And they had to take down the whole production facility and reboot everything. And this delayed the production of vaccine for a number of months. All of a sudden, there was this huge demand. People were lining up outside retirement homes all over the place in Florida to get the flu vaccine. Made the news. Uh, at the same time, we've got people sort of who've been scared to get the vaccine. And so in 1974, a paper that appropriately goes unnamed, uh, connected uh, <laughs> pertussis to autism. That, uh, that pertussis immunization is causing autism. And this idea propagated. Uh, people started, stopped sort of vaccinating their children with the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine uh, in the UK, and it's since spread to the US. And uh, that's resulted in resurgence of, of some of these diseases, like measles in our current outbreak. Um, and then uh, we almost had polio eradicated a number of years ago. Uh, in particular, there were just a few spots it was left. In, and uh, they were pretty small. And there's this one spot in Nigeria where we almost got rid of it. And then all of a sudden, people became concerned that the vaccine was causing sterility. And, and that this was some type of population control propagated by the World Health to keep the numbers of Africans down. And um, everyone stopped vaccinating. Uh, and we had a resurgence in the number of cases of polio. And it escaped out of that part of Nigeria into some other parts of the world. And so this eradication campaign that could have gotten rid of polio forever for us failed because of this scare that people suddenly became concerned about uh, the vaccines we were using. So this is not a new problem. This is actually an old problem as uh, the vaccines themselves are. So uh, over on the left there, we have Edward Jenner, who was the man who imported uh, vaccination from using the vaccinia virus to protect against smallpox from uh, the Middle East. And uh, in 1802, to, to promote smallpox vaccination, they were having going to soup kitchens and giving people free food. And while they were there, they were vaccinating them to protect them from smallpox. And in this cartoon, they're, they're giving the, the young man on the left uh, soup, and they're vaccinating the, the woman on the right. Um, but at the same time, the vaccine is turning people into cows. So this. Lady up here has a cow growing over her head. Here's a cow coming out the guy's ear. Uh, I've cut off a bunch of stuff, but they're all basically mutating into some form of bovine process. <laughs> uh, which, as far as I can tell, there's no evidence for, but I guess the jury's still out. Um, 100 years later, almost, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who many of us know for his important contributions to evolution, wrote a treaty, vaccination, a delusion, it's penal enforcement a crime. Because the government was forcing mass vaccination against smallpox to protect them. And um, Wallace was of the opinion that this was 
not needed, it was dangerous, um, that there was the scientific evidence didn't support its value. He was wrong. Um, but uh, this was a scientist who had this sort of confused opinion on the subject. And so this is something that our, our theory of epidemiology doesn't explain as it stands in the classical sense. Yeah. So why is this? Why are people resisting immunization? Um, and, and not just immunization, other medical advances as well. People are afraid of medicine in some way. And our, our traditional pictures of epidemics and epidemic management are sort of physics and chemistry based pictures. It's like people are like particles and they bounce around and they react like chemical reactions. And we write down those chemical reactions, that tells us how these spreads. Um, but that's not explaining this problem that we're facing here. It's, a, it's something different. So, okay, well, why? Well, maybe the world's just a messy place and our equations are wrong. That's certainly true. Um, maybe this is some quirk of human nature. We're just not wired to sort of represent, solve physics equations well enough, and so that's what's screwing everything up. Um, or maybe there's actually a reason for this. Maybe it's something we can explain. So there's a lot of different approaches to this sort of thing. Okay, if we're going to try to say or explain this human behavior, this <coughs> picture, how do we approach it? And so there's a social science approach to this. And so this is a, a diagram that's called the uh, group grid model from social science. And what it does is it splits up people's picture of the world into sort of how much they like organization versus uh, independent uh, action and on, the group, on the grid axis, which is the vertical axis. And then um, how much they sort of view individualization versus collective action on the horizontal group axis. Uh, and you sort of put these down and you can split the world up into these four categories. The sort of fatalists who believe that the world is relatively flat and you can just sort of be anywhere you want on there and there's no reason to sort of try to control it. You've got hierarchicalists who say, um, there's a good place for the world to be, and uh, you, but if you push things too far, they might collapse, and so you want to keep things ordered and hierarchical. You've got individualists who say, the world is convex. Do whatever you want, it'll fix itself. Don't worry. And you've got the egalitarians who say, the world is concave. We're, we're at that one spot where everything is OK. And <laughs> go, if we, we were not careful, if we throw the balance off, it's all going to fall apart. It's going to be the end. And is it, so it's a kind of an interesting picture. Um, but I, I'm, it's, it's a very fuzzy picture. You can sort of find people. So from a social science perspective, you sort of classify people based on their views and how they fit into this picture. But uh, uh, I think that the, that's not an arbitrary choice. There is actually a shape to the world in some way. The, the, one of these curves or some set of other generalizations of these curves is probably the actual way the world is. And it's important to know what that is. What is the actual shape of the world? If we want to design or understand our actions or make better policy, let's figure out what the shapes of these curves are, and then we won't have this sort of arbitrary choice among our um, possibilities. All right. So, uh, so uh, first of all, I want to set numbers to the world. So let's say uh, I, want, I want to make decisions. I want to base this on some numbers of what's good and bad. So I want to write down uh, an equation for this. The simplest thing to do is to take my path in life forward. I know what's going to happen to me tomorrow, in a week, in a month, in a year, and what decisions I'm going to make. And each of those decisions was going to have some consequences, some value to me, good or bad. And I'm just going to add all that up with an integral over the future, and maybe discount things farther in the future versus less in the future, because I might die, or I might not care about the future as much as I care about today. And that gives me some payoff function I can optimize, some mu. So that's nice. But unfortunately, I don't really know what my future is. I need something else uh, to deal with the fact that I don't know what my future is. And so, um, your former brief faculty member, Richard Feynman, came up with the solution <laughs> to this. Uh, it, it, and he came up with it in a um, physics context, but we can apply that to our life context as well. What's your life? 
You were born because you're in this room. You're going to die someday. Hate to break it to you. Uh, along the way, there's a lot of things that can happen to you. You can drop out of public school, join a band, record, get a record deal, <laughs> sex, drugs, rock and roll, repeat, 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 repeat. repeat. Uh, you might go to public school, get a crappy job, marry, uh, get divorced, retire, go to a nursing home. Uh, you might go to a private school in an Ivy League college, graduate, become a postdoc, become a postdoc, stay a postdoc for a <laughs> So there's a lot of different paths we can find. And if we want to actually sort of figure out the value, we should integrate over those paths. Well, Feynman figured out how to do path integrals. And so instead of just doing one integral, we can integrate over all our paths and get some type of payoff function that's an expected payoff over all our life paths. Um, that's a very daunting mathematical task, but it turns out that in some simple situations we can actually do that. So you can do it using Markov decision process theory. We write down a Markov process that describes the, the changes in our lives from day to day. And of course it's a much simplified description of what happens in our lives, um, but we can write it down. We can get a transition matrix for that. And I'm just throwing up equations here for the sake of showing you that aren't there are equations. But so we get some initial conditions on where we start in our life. We've got a different system of linear differential equations for the evolution over time. And then we've got some payoff function that says, what costs and benefits do I get from different events? How important is it for me to get married? How important is it for me to make a lot of money? I mean, we can measure that in whatever we want. We don't have to measure in terms of money. But as long as we have some way of measuring that, we can put it into a formula and do this whole thing to calculate that path integral. So let's do an example. Let's talk about this vaccination problem that I was talking about a moment ago. Uh, so this is uh, some work by Paul Fine and Jacqueline Clarkson from the early 80s, which is sort of the beginning of the field of uh, epidemiological game theory that I work in now. And they said, all right, we've got these choices. Um, we've got some uh, infectious disease that may change my life, and I've got uh, the choices I make that can increase or decrease my risk of getting that. So I've got this choice, do I immunize? Um, if I immune, if I get the immunization, I'm going to pay some cost for the vaccine, but hopefully that's it. If I don't get immunized, well, I might get sick. Well, this is a bit vague, I might, I might not. Let's, let's put some numbers on it. So immunize, yes, no. And if I get immunized, okay, well, does the vaccine work? It might work for me. The flu vaccine actually seems to only work 50% of the time. This year, maybe even less than that. Um, and so there's some chance that it uh, works. And then all I've had to do is pay whatever cost that vaccine was to me. On the other hand, if the vaccine doesn't take, I might get infected or I might not get infected. So there's some chance that I get infected, A, some chance I don't get infected, one minus A. If I get infected, then I've had to pay the cost of the vaccine and the cost of the disease. If I don't get infected, I still had to pay the cost of the vaccine, even though it didn't work. If I don't immunize, then I have to, this chance, do I get sick, do I not get sick? So the cost of the disease if I get sick. If I didn't immunize and I didn't get sick, I don't have to pay anything. So these are the paths. And you say, okay, here's your choice, yes or no, and what's your expected payoff from each of those choices? If I immunize, I've got the cost of the vaccine with some weighted uh, probabilities multiplying the cost of uh, getting sick. And if I don't immunize, uh, then I've got the cost, chance of getting sick times the cost of sick, and the chance that I don't get sick times the cost of not being sick, which is zero. So straightforward. Turned, so in this particular case, it's turned out to be a very simple calculation. It's a very limited formulation, though. In reality, we do continuous time. Disease is being introduced all the time. Uh, it may go up, it may go down. Uh, and different people are choosing to immunize at different times. And so uh, instead of dealing with that sort of that piecewise tree of decisions, uh, I want to deal with a continuous time process where the decisions are made all the time by different people. So down here, I've got a standard epidemic model. It's an SIRV model, so we've got Susceptible individuals interact with sick individuals to become sick, infected, infected, recover. The re recovered individuals are immune for some time, but eventually return to being susceptible. And vaccinated in, uh, individuals 
eventually be returned as susceptible, but you can vaccinate and return uh, to the vaccinated class anytime you want. And so for an individual, this is a Markov process in continuous time. So we've got a simple set of linear equations. They're, they're linear equations, but they depend on the prevalence of disease. Your risk of getting sick depends on how many sick people there are in the world. Uh, so this is a Markov process that's time dependent potentially in the matrix. Uh, at our population level, when we average this over everybody, we've just got a system of four nonlinear ODEs. Well, the nonlinearity is coming in this infection pressure term, lambda of I, which we can represent in a whole bunch of different ways. But we've got population dynamics, and then what happens to me day to day. In my choice, the important piece here is pi. Pi is going to be sort of my, ch I, it's a probability that I choose to get the vaccine today if I'm susceptible. So if at pi is zero, I just never get the vaccine. If pi is uh, one over a year, then I get the vaccine once a year for flu. If it's uh, one half, I get it in half a year. Or I'm screwing that up, apologies. But the idea is that this is sort of my choice. Uh, the populations of dynamics don't depend on what I'm doing as an individual, but the average of what the population is doing. And so there's this pi bar, which is the population's average vaccination rate, moves <laughs> people down here to the vaccinated. So there's individuals, what I do as an individual, and then there's a population average, which enters into the equations in two different places. So I can throw that um, Markov process into my Markov decision <laughs> theory framework, and I've got this sort of nice simple matrix equation with a matrix inversion in there that tells me sort of what my payoff is going to be for a given strategy. And so this is the big long thing that comes out. Important pieces are that it depends on the prevalence of disease, and I'm going to just say this is all at equilibrium for now. So if we know the equilibrium presence or frequency of disease, we can find the equilibrium infection pressure. And it depends on my own choice pi of how often I vaccinate. So the pi appear here and here, and the force of infection appears here and here. So I've got this payoff function that I want to optimize. And so, okay, okay, what's what's my optimal vaccination rate? And it depends, like you would imagine, on the force of infection. If there's a very high force of infection, it's very likely that I'll get sick if I don't vaccinate. Um, so this is this utility, so smaller is better. Uh, if I vaccinate uh, slowly, I end up paying a cost of 15. If I vaccinate quickly, I could get my cost down mm -hmm. to 11. So vaccinating faster is better when there's a high force of infection. On the other hand, if there's no uh, infection around, so I have no chance of getting sick, then the uh, faster I vaccinate, the higher my disutility, the worse off I am. So the best thing to do if there's no disease around is not to vaccinate. I pay no cost for the vaccine. I pay no cost for the disease. I'm happy. And just for reference, these are all I've said flu is something like flu, so it lasts for about a week. They are not for the disease of about two. Uh, and the there's a, about three year duration of immunity. And um, for the sake of argument, to make the pictures nice, I've said the cost of the illness is about four times the cost of the vaccine. So this is, this is a fudge, and I'll address that in a little bit. All right, so that's my choice. So I just look at the prevalence of disease around. Lots of disease, get the vaccine. No disease, don't get the vaccine. Simple. What about the social planner? What about the person who's saying, I've got a, a city and I want to vaccinate people in my city. Um, how quickly do I want people to get the vaccine? Do I want them uh, to get it every year? Do I want them to get the flu vaccine every 10 years? And so if we just set the individual strategy uh, equal to the population strategy, we can get a, pop, a plot of the, the community's uh, disutility as a function of the vaccination rate per year. And we get a slightly different picture. We get this picture where things get better as you vaccinate more and more and more up to, and it turns out this is the r naught threshold for vaccine. And at the r naught threshold of vaccine, we get a corner, and at vaccinating at higher rates, the community is doing worse off because there's no disease around at that point, but you're still paying more cost for the vaccine. So uh, the optimal thing for the community is to vaccinate exactly at the herd immunity threshold. You get rid of disease. Uh, and if you vaccinate slower, you'd have disease around, you'd have to worry about. If you vaccinate faster than that, then you're just wasting extra effort vaccinating. 
So this is, this is a little different than my choices. The individuals who are going to get the vaccine as soon as possible or don't get it, from the population perspective, we're saying, well, we should, everyone should be getting the vaccine about every three years. So it's a bit of an issue. There's a much bigger issue, though. So I, this is an XKCD comic I'm stealing here. It is a diagram uh, in terms of timelines of a number of famous movies um, of relatively recent era. The most famous, I should say, should be Star Wars. And so what this does is it tracks the locations of the various characters over the course of the movie. Uh, so this is the Star Wars trilogy. Let's see. This is Chewbacca here, and he goes down, and he ends up being with Luke, Solo, Luke Skywalker for a while, but then he's off somewhere else. Ends up sort of with Han Solo again, various places along the way. We've got uh, Yoda's off on, um, what was it? Dagobah for most of the movie. Then, it, then he gets introduced to Luke Skywalker, then he dies. Um, various people move all the way around. So that's Star Wars. Here's Lord of the Rings with Frodo and Bilbo and the orcs come in here and Gandalf is just all over the place. Uh, Jurassic Park, we've got a few dinosaurs running around. Twelve Angry Men. And my favorite, of course, if you ever figure out the actual timeline for Primer, please tell me. I've worked on this myself and it, who knows, time travel movies are a mess. Um, but the point here is that people interact with other people, and that interaction is important. That's what drives the plot of these movies. And in that model I've just put down, we've got no interaction. There's no accounting for interactions from one person to another. So this is where the theory of population games comes in. In particular, we've got large numbers where people are interacting with each other. That interaction is important. So um, we're going to extend that sort of simple optimization framework to be a game. Right? where it accounts for uh, people's actions and how people's actions have an effect on your life. And so you have these decisions, right? Do you trust your doctor to give you the immunization or do you not? And uh, that had, we get our actions, which have side effects, which interact with all the other actions of all the other people on the beach and wherever we are, which interact with the environment, drive the interactions, or the actions of other agents in turn, and we get these feedback cycles that we need to deal with daunting problem, but it turns out we can do this. So let me talk about game theory a little to give you a context. So instead of just optimizing this function u as a, a one variable function, I'm now going to talk about it as a payoff function. So u depends on my strategy pi, what I do, and the average behavior of everyone else. And theory should depend on all the behaviors of all the other people, but I'm going to reduce it down to this average to make things more tractable. And so we've got this payoff function u that's how much I make using pi, given that the average behavior is pi bar. And if I want to know what the average payoff in the population is, this is a really large population, so I assume that my own actions have no effect on the average. And so the average is going to, for the pay, payoff for the population is just going to be to put pi bar in for pi in that first one. And in game theory, you make a number of assumptions that uh, are useful. So first of all, we assume that there's something called money that we can measure the value of things in. Uh, we're going to assume that everyone's making their own choices, that they act independently on their own, that they've got some type of rational objectives that they're pursuing and making decisions, that they've got perfect information on which to make those decisions, so there's no sort of, well, what if this, what if that, and that they've got unlimited computing power in sort of resolving that information. All of these are wrong, all right? You might, I, I would even argue that this assumption of the existence of money is, is not right in a number of biological contexts. But they let us get somewhere. And so rather than dwell on why they're wrong, let's just take them for the moment. We'll deal with that later. All right, so I have this function u of pi pi bar, and I, then I want to have some concept of a, a solution to this. And there's, there's two solution concepts I need to mention. So uh, what's it mean to sort of, so here I've plotted um, this utility. So I want to minimize this utility, smaller is better. I have my strategy on the x-axis, what should I do? And so, and uh, the dotted line here is the population's uh, average behavior. That population's average behavior leads to a, a payoff function for me that's convex and looks like this. So what's my best response? What should I do if I know what everyone else is doing? So this pi b is the best response to the population's average behavior. 
and that's just a minimization problem. So given any pi bar, I can find the pi b that's the bottom of that. That's nice. Um, at equilibrium, if sort of the population changes the behavior, then I change behavior, then the population changes behavior, then we've got this iterative process that sort of doesn't resolve. So at equilibrium, we decide to say that, that would, uh, the population would be happy if I'm, my best response is exactly what I'm doing and what everyone else is doing. There's no incentive made for me then to change my behavior if that correspondence occurs. And so this is sort of what a Nash equilibrium is, a situation where the strategy I'm using is the best response to what the population is doing as a whole. And so everyone will adopt that strategy and it's sort of self-consistent. Um, so that John Nash sort of did a little math to show that one of these Nash equilibria already existed in a sort of a mixed strategy game. Um, got a Nobel Prize, really nice. So that's a really useful concept <coughs> for solving games. Uh, there's another concept which gets, gets a lot less attention, but is also really important. Um, I'm, I'm going to call this spike minimization today, though I change what I call it every time. Um, so you've all played games, right? I imagine a lot of you are students in college right now still play games on, uh, once in a while. Um, when I was in college, I had a friend who I, I hated playing with. I loved the guy, still friends with him. Um, but it was such a nightmare playing because he would, I'd spend all this time working on my strategies for these games. And um, his, his whole frame for the game was different than mine. His idea was that he was going to win the game. But as soon as he wasn't going to win the game, he was going to make the person who messed him up lose. <laughs> and he didn't care how badly he lost the game as long as you lost with him. He was going to pull you down. <laughs> and so that changed the entire way I had to play my game. I had to, to, to sort of say, well, my strategy has to be robust against whatever he's going to do to me because I know somehow I'm going to mess him up and, and then I'm going to lose the game. So uh, what, what happens when you ask this question? All right, well, so here, here's a diagram. Now, we're, let's say I'm going to pick one strategy, and I have to make sure that strategy is robust to whatever my opponents do. So I say, OK, if I pick strategy pi, which is about 0.4 in this case, my opponents can choose any other strategy here. And um, then the green line is going to be uh, their payoff, and the blue line is my payoff. So the worst situation would be if they chose this strategy, and my payoff is going to be the difference between what they get and what I get. So in this case, I'm going to do a little worse than they did. If they choose a different strategy, so if they, if they use the strategy of 0.5 or 0.6, uh, I'm going to do better than them. But if they're aiming to make me do bad, the best thing they could do would be using a strategy of 0.25 or so. And I'm going to do worse than everyone else, and I'm going to lose the game. So what do I do to make myself robust this? Well, I look for a strategy where um, no matter what they do, I'm going to do better than them. I'm going to minimize uh, the impact of their spite on me. And so in this, this is a, such a situation where um, I'm choosing this strategy. And if they choose that same strategy, we all do the same. I tie them. But if they choose anything else, I do better. So if the blue line is below the green line in all of these positions. Uh, so this is actually equivalent to an idea John Maynard Smith introduced um, in his study of evolutionary games. Uh, it's um, invasion potential. When can uh, a strategy beat all the other strategies that are available to it, or at least tie them? And if you combine this um, spike minimization strategy with Nash's strategy, we get an evolutionary stable strategy, a strategy that is uh, beats everyone else if they play badly, and uh, can never be improved on by anyone else by unilateral evolution. <coughs> and so the, and this evolutionary stable strategy is our ideal for a solution to the game. It doesn't always exist, but when it does exist, it dominates everything else. All right. So, all right. I can right now, I change my game around so that Instead of just having my individual strategy in my payoff function, I now have the population's average behavior. Same formula as I had up a moment ago, but now this prevalence of infection has an explicit formula. So if we say that we have a mass action <coughs> infection pressure, then we get a pi bar 
in here. And now this is a function of pi and pi bar rather than depending on the dynamic state variables like it did before. And so I can put numbers on all those parameters and I get a, a utility function that looks like this. On the x-axis, I've got my choice of vaccination rate. And on the vertical axis, I've got the population's choice of vaccination rate. So the first question is, well, where's the best place in the world? If I, do, I and everyone else do the same thing and we all are, agree on what we do, what's the best spot? So that's going to be somewhere along the diagonal line where my strategy equals everyone else's strategy. And you look and you see that, okay, that's around here. So that's going to be about vaccinating once every uh, three years or so. So that's the best sort of coming from a community perspective. But if you look at, so these are contours of uh, this utility, so small is better. If everyone's vaccinating at this rate and I choose my strategy, I can lower my payoff, my cost from the disease and the vaccine by vaccinating at a slower rate. So I can defect from that sort of collective action strategy and do better than everyone else. <coughs> and so this is not stable in the best response sense that Nash defined. So, uh, so what is? Uh, if I divide through by everyone's uh, average payoff to normalize things, so green is good, red is bad, a one is average, when everyone does everything, when it's normalized. And we find a different point. We find a point down near point two, uh, where um, it's got invasion potential in the sense that if I vaccinate at about point two and the population does anything else, I do at least as good as them. Uh, and usually better. So if the population is vaccinating faster and I vaccinate at 0.2, I do better. If the population is vaccinating slower and I vaccinate at 0.2, I do better. So it satisfies the spike minimization condition. And then um, if everyone is vaccinating at around 0.2 and I change my strategy, I get the same payoff. So this game is a bit degenerate in the sense that uh, this line is perfectly flat, but it turns out that's a property of these games as they're formulated. Um, but I never do worse, and so uh, it satisfies Nash's condition that I can't defect and do better. So we've got these two solutions then. We've got sort of this utopia, what's best for the community, and we've got this game theoretic solution for the Nash equilibrium. So here's, and as we vary the cost of the vaccine relative to the cost of the disease, we see that these change um, depending on that cost. The more, so if the vaccine is perfectly, uh, is free, there's no cost associated with it, that everyone agrees everyone should get the vaccine. There's no cost to the vaccine, it stops the disease. Everyone, the Nash equilibrium and um, the community all agree that we should get the vaccine as quickly as possible. But as the cost of the vaccine increases, we get this split between the choices. Um, the community is saying vaccinate about every, once every three years, and uh, at the numbers I had before, uh, the Nash equilibrium was saying vaccinate once every five years. As the cost increases, though, and the vaccine becomes very expensive, they converge again. They come back to the same number. If the vaccine is very expensive, everyone agrees the vaccine is worse than the disease, and we shouldn't get it. So it's only in this sort of intermediate or intermediate region of values for vaccination cost that there's this disagreement and at the extremes they come together. So this is an example of an economics <laughs> property called free writing where you can get somewhere you want to go without having to do any of your work on your own. And so in this particular case, the dog has figured out he doesn't have to actually walk anywhere, he just waits for the sheep to come home from pasture and he's home, he's good. Uh, and, and in the free ride, this is exactly what happens in our game here. Everyone else is vaccinating, so they've reduced the prevalence of disease, so I don't have to get the vaccine to get the benefits of that. I can skip out on the cost of the vaccine and uh, still get the benefits of having other people vaccinate. So the answer, so we have this, we also have this dilemma, and the, the dilemma is not resolved by mathematics. It's a philosophical dilemma. So is, is the right answer the Nash equilibrium, or is the right answer the optimization utopia? Um, this is a, a picture from iRobot, which is an okay movie, but philosophically actually much better than it's given credit for. And the dilemma at the end of the movie is, Who's right here? Is it the all-powerful AI who can organize the world and make everything perfect for us at the cost of us no longer having control over our own fates? 
or is it the sort of independent AI with the human qualities who says free will is important, we have to make our own choices even if um, that's harmful sometimes to us? For the actual problem, the, the answer is a no-brainer. I want to make this clear. Uh, <laughs> positive vaccines are low. We have made sure that our vaccines are very safe, we've also made them very inexpensive and very widely available. And so we all actually are at this left endpoint where they agree. Up to any measure that we can sort of reasonably constitute, um, the best thing for the community is also the best thing for us as individuals. So get your vaccines. Uh, there probably will be cases where this is more complicated in the future, but for now, for the childhood back, uh, infections, it's a pretty clear answer. All right, so, so that's a vaccine story. Um, but this is a much more general phenomenon that appears. It's called, we call it policy resistance. It's the tendency of interventions by government or institutions to, de to be defeated by the system's response to the intervention itself. And here's some examples. So nicotine and cigarettes. Cigarettes are dangerous. They've got lots of carcinogens in them. Uh, nicotine makes these cigarettes addictive to us. Uh, so we said, OK, let's lower the tar, nicotine, and cigarettes. That should make them less addictive, make them less dangerous. We'll all be better off. Uh, didn't work. Why didn't it work? Well, because people addicted to nicotine um, need their nicotine. And so if you need that dose of nicotine and you got to smoke 10 cigarettes instead of one cigarette to get it, you smoke the 10 cigarettes. And so instead of actually decreasing the amount of carcinogens people were exposed to, lowering the nicotine levels increased the amount of carcinogens people were exposed to. And it wasn't the, the technical side of this, it was the people's response to it that makes it fail. Um, antibiotic use. Uh, we like to use antibiotics because they improve our health, but because we use them so much and we don't use them effectively sometimes, uh, the bacteria evolve resistance to these antibiotics and that effectiveness is lost because of our overuse and abuse potentially of them. Uh, heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy has been a miracle for HIV, <laughs> right? People, Magic Johnson was diagnosed with HIV while he was in high school and he's still in great health. Uh, 10 years before that, he would have been dead rather quickly. So heart's an incredible medical advance that lets people with HIV live much longer. But there was a, it was a negative behavioral effect. All of a sudden, HIV went from a terminal illness that was going to kill you to something that people just had, and they were fine. And so all of a sudden, that risk, I don't want to have unsafe sex because I, I could die from it. You can't, man. It, it makes people look good. They get skinny. They get all cut. <laughs> I think I want HIV. Um, and, and so uh, this, the, this treatment, uh, actually discouraged, it removed the disincentive for people. And uh, not only has HIV resurged in some areas, but other sexually transmitted diseases have resurged because of this change in behavior. And there's lots of other examples. Building new roads, making anti-lock rigs for cars, suppressing fires and forests. Um, all of these things are situations where the behavioral response has become as important, or more important than the, the, the biology. The, the classic case of this, so this all traces back to Hardin's tragedy of the commons. Uh, in 1968, he wrote this marvelous piece saying, well, if we let people make these decisions on their own, they're going to do things like put too many cows on a piece of land, because they don't lose. They want to grab that resource as quickly as possible, shove all the cows. But then the consequence is that that piece of land becomes unproductive for every cow. We lose all that productivity, and it becomes the worst possible case for everybody. All right. Uh, so enter our hero. Um, so Eleanor Ostrom um, won the Nobel Prize in 2009. And uh, her, her, my favorite work of hers is this book, Governing the Commons. And in it, she lays out all of this sort of issues with governing the commons. The fact that people defect, they don't want to cooperate, and that we can make the world a very bad place for ourselves. And she also shows that sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes we build systems for the management of food, and water and resources that work, that actually function, reach an equilibrium, and if people have free will in these systems, they can do whatever they want, but they don't destroy the system because of the way the system is constructed. 
So we, and, and so I farmed by that, I tried to make a mathematical model of it. So let's, let's think of this simple case of clean water. So diarrheal diseases are a big issue in the developing world, in particular Africa. Um, and we can deal, improve that by a bunch of methods. We can uh, dig clean, reliable wells. We can subsidize chlorination and hygiene in various ways. We can educate. Uh, we can clean the water upstream. We can build sanitation networks. But each of these different things we do works in a different way. They're not all the same shape. So, okay, we've got a simple epidemic model for disease transmission of a diarrheal disease. S and I are our uh, state variables. Uh, S is susceptible, I is infected. But now we have a slightly different um, strategy. Instead of controlling vaccination, we're going to control the risk of getting sick. So uh, CS is how much the average person is invested in, in social distancing to reduce their risk of getting sick, and that reduces the transmission rate. So this is, and then CT is how much the government is investing in protecting and reducing transmission of disease. And then we've got recovery rate and transmission rates uh, according to the usual assumptions. And so this function sigma of CS and CT is sort of what's controlling how the system works. Uh, we then can put down our Markov process for the risk to an individual, and we can figure out the equilibrium disease uh, risk that depends on the, uh, this function sigma of the average <laughs> individual investment and the average government investment. And the payoff function, well, let's assume a closed system. Let's say that this payoff function depends on how much I invest for myself, CS, how much government invests in protecting me, CT, uh, a bunch of other things, H is a discount parameter, and that money the government invests, it comes from me. The government has to take money away from my income to invest to protect me. So this is, economists get bonkers when I say this. For me, it's not a closed system. We can create money, but it, this feels happier to me, so. Um, and then, so, and how, okay, how do we try to define policy resistance in this? So there's some average payoff, which is what I do, what everyone else is doing, and the government does CT. We've got this W function that depends on the average behavior. That's sort of um, the good, the average person. Policy resistance is when I think I'm going to do something good. I change my policy in a way that I think is going to make people better off. But then people react negatively to that and do something that counteracts <coughs> that change. So, um, if I do some change in policy that makes this positive, but we take the differentiation of, of that with respect to the policy, and then look at how the Nash equilibrium behavior depends on the policy, and that ends up being negative. Okay, so policy is good, but people's response to it is the opposite. We can also imagine a policy reinforcement situation where I have some thing that I want to do, some investment that's going to make the world better off, and people react positively to that policy. So this derivative multiplied by my other things ends up being positive. So they've got these two competing things. Which one of these actually happens? Well, here are two different sigma functions. Uh, these are contour plots of sigma under different hypotheses. On the left, I'm assuming that my interventions and government interventions are independent. Government does something that makes the water cleaner, and then I do something that changes my risk. Versus um, facilitation, what I call facilitative interventions, where government does something that gives me opportunity. So in this case, I think of this as digging wells. I can't dig a big well myself or make a sanitation system myself, but if it's dug for me, I can take advantage of it. I don't have to, I can go still drink water from the dirty river if I want, but I have this choice now that I didn't have before. And so this, uh, if government invests a certain minimal amount, all of a sudden I have a much greater set of choices available to me than if government doesn't, and I just have to go drink water from the dirty river. So two competing hypotheses for how these interventions work. Uh, in the independent sense, if I can break, break my sigma up into the product of two functions for each of these interventions, I always get policy resistance. And I can show this mathematically. No matter how I do it, uh, the derivative of my Nash equilibrium with respect to an increase in investment by the government decreases the Nash equilibrium. Doesn't mean it's going to be worse in a global sense, but it's always going to decrease it. 
So this, if we plot then uh, the Nash equilibrium, as I invest more, if government taxes me more, invest that, how much I protect myself goes down until I can't invest anymore. But how well is the population doing? Pay off to everyone else, well, it goes down for a little while, but once it hits that point, it goes up. And that's the best thing. So even, so we get policy resistance here, but even though we get policy resistance, the best thing for the government to do in this case is just tax the, the Jesus out of us and uh, <laughs> invest enough to stop the transmission of disease. And so this is a sort of more detailed breakdown. What we can see here, so this is the, the sigma function. Here's the force of infection for the various investments by individuals and the, the public. Here's the best response on that space. And then ultimately, we get this payoff function. Uh, w depends on the average and the government investments. And uh, the dark line here is the Nash equilibrium again. In this space, the red is the best outcomes, and the reds are all over here. And so uh, as they, we tax more, the Nash equilibrium comes down, and that really doesn't change the payoff very much. But then you get to this risk. That's the best payoff you want to tax out to that point, doing the best you can. What about the other case? The facilitative case. If um, this derivative is negative, and we get a condition on the second derivative, mixed partial, uh, then we actually get a result that uh, there's always a possibility um, that public investment will uh, create policy reinforcement. It will give us the opportunity to help ourselves. Putting some numbers for that uh, sigma function I showed a little bit ago. Uh, as government taxes more, okay, things get a little worse off for us, but then at a certain point, all of a sudden, they start getting better. And uh, everything's, that's the best, and then if they tax us even more, well, a lot of that money is just being wasted. It doesn't give us more opportunity. And what about our behavior? Well, don't do anything, can't do anything, can't do anything, can't do anything. All of a sudden, I have options, I have choices. I choose to invest in my own well-being, and, but then I can't do any better than that by personal choice of that end of being And the way this plays out in sort of the next diagram, I can't achieve the optimum. I would love it if everyone would invest uh, at this rate, the government would tax at that rate, that's the best I can do. I can't reach there with a Nash equilibrium, but I can get close. And the best spot is down over here. And so we get sort of that being the best policy. And so we can actually predict using this theory, policy reinforcement, policy resistance scenarios uh, by combining the dynamic systems with the game theory. Um, I'm out of time, so I'll skip sort of the other sort of interesting messages. Uh, take home, play games. Uh, this is uh, my favorite role-playing game, Transhuman Space. People laugh at role-playing games. I uh, you go play, go pretend to be an orc. Uh, go pretend to be a wizard, throw stuff at people. Um, games are the best way to figure stuff out, in both maybe in theory, but also um, in terms of real decisions. And this one is sort of a near future, uh, hard sci-fi, next hundred years kind of one, so give it a little promotion. All right. <laughs> uh, people at um, various places helped me out with this work. Jing Lee was my postdoc, and now at one of the Cal State places. Um, and Darla Lindbergh and Rachel Smith were my collaborators at Penn State. Thanks. assume that everybody's the same, that you've got a population where there's young people and old people, old people more susceptible to disease. Uh, so the age structure we can deal with. So we, I've worked on models where we incorporate that sort of difference. Um, but fundamentally, you're right. The model, even if I put an age structure, I'm still assuming everyone's aging the same way or that there's some sort of homogeneity among people's decision processes. Uh, and at any given time, people are different ages, and so they're going to behave differently because of that. Right. Well, but we can interpret that. So in the game theory context, what we're going to say is that, well, your decision today may uh, be different than your decision when you're um, 80 years old, but uh, I'm going to take into account that future if I'm making rational choices. So what I do today should be based on what's going to happen to me when I'm 50, 60, 70, 80. And if you sort of do that accounting the right way, then it's, it's fine. It's not an issue. It's cob more complicated, of course, but in terms of the general approach, we're, we can handle it. I feel like I didn't quite answer what you were asking. Well, I believe you. Okay. <laughs> so in the simple definition game, you talked about these two extremes that we often see in economics. So you have the sort of free market that's going to make everybody make their own choices, and you have a social plan that people will never get. And you get 
Well, they're only different in that intermediate region. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so what I wanted to say was, have you thought about maybe um, modeling this in more higher sense? So, like, you have a certain degree of social planning through public health policy. Right. So, the most immediate case for that is that in these models, we've assumed basically that parents are making interest in the best interest of their children because babies aren't making these choices. Mm -hmm. So I've just sort of thrown that under the rug there. But it's not the baby making the choice, it's the parent. And so there is this degree of collective choice for any family group or any sort of more larger, more coherent social group. A lot of times we see this in churches where they, they sort of don't like Western medicine, so they're foregoing drugs and vaccines and stuff. Um, yes, I have thought about it. No, no one's gotten around to dealing with it, at least in this literature. It's a good point, and we should be able to. So in, in, a, in a strictly deductive game theory framework, that is assumed. So um, I haven't really dealt with time-dependent differential games in this talk. Um, but in all of these settings, we're assuming perfect unlimited computation, which is implying that they're predicting the course of the epidemic in the future. Uh, in some sense, that's not that big a deal, because I can always localize my decision making, make it less rational, and just sort of saying that you're reacting in a dynamical system sense to whatever you see right now. So there's a number of models that sort of say there's look at sort of media and advertisement and news and how that might affect decision making in sort of a, um, a heuristic approach. And so we get so there's work on that. Um, and the discounting term count also counts for that in some sense. And that the larger your discounting is, the less you pay attention to the future relative to your present. Um, nonetheless, there's there's still issues with that. that I, and so in, as far as my mathematics goes, yes, I'm assuming people are predicting the epidemic as far into the future as they want. In what sense is the population that you always talk about in these models, uh, like a country or something, is it like is this model applicable to a more global setting? The, the reason why I'm asking this question, the motivation is the whole Ebola uh, thing was sort of imported into various places. And so it's difficult on a level to prepare for it because it's not like it's a the thing you have to deal with locally in a country, but there's always a probability because we travel much more that that disease will will spread uh, much further than it was intended to. So, how, how does the model change with respect to that? Um, so that, that changes the problem very radically. You know, you're sort of you're dealing with sort of this unknown input that you're trying to hedge the risks for, and the individuals hedging those risks it can be very different than governments hedging those risks. So in a lot of places, people face such risks from infectious disease, from things like malaria that are already there, that they tell them Ebola is coming. It's not really that big a concern compared to their current problems. Um, I, I would basically say that I don't address that within this circle. But it's, it's of course, important. In your um, diary, like disease example at the end, you, you, I may have you, I missed it, but there were four strategies you mentioned, but then which one is the one that, that I wonder if Austin would recommend or that your math Oh, recommend? well, so um, all of these are good options. And I'm only pointing out that sort of how, what, how things play out for the option depends on how it actually works. Um, so in the analysis, the sort of having cases where there's facilitation is nice because you sort of get people to help themselves, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's better off. We might have this independent situation where everything still works out better for those interventions. Um, this analysis isn't really going to say which one of those is. You need to really get into the accounting of costs. So, um, and so we have a project uh, where this refugee camps in, Thai in from Burma in Malaysia, in Thailand. Uh, that we're sort of trying to do some of that for cholera prevention. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker, and um, there's refreshments uh, next door. <laughs>